Picture this. It's 1947. America's farms are desperate for equipment. Dealers are selling full-size pickups for $1,500 when you can even find one. Then a radio manufacturer releases a pickup truck smaller than a modern golf cart powered by an engine from a Navy generator. It costs $949. Farm equipment dealers laughed. They stopped laughing when it outsold their tractors. The Crosley pickup measured just 145 inches long. That's shorter than a modern Mini Cooper. Its 80-inch wheelbase was smaller than a smart car's. The track width? 45 inches. You could literally drive this thing between cornrows without touching a single stalk. But here's where it gets interesting. This tiny machine with its 30-horsepower engine could haul 1,000 pounds of cargo. That's nearly 90% of its own weight. A modern F-150 can only haul about 50% of its weight. This is the story of how a Cincinnati radio magnate built America's most unlikely farm truck and why over 5,000 farmers, businesses, and even the U.S. military bought them. To understand why anyone would build a pickup truck with less power than a modern riding mower, we need to travel back to 1939. Powell Crosley Jr. wasn't a car guy. He was a radio guy. Actually, scratch that. He was a make-things-affordable guy. Crosley had already revolutionized radio by selling sets for $20 when competitors charged $100. He invented the push-button car radio. He owned the Cincinnati Reds. He built refrigerators. The man had a simple philosophy. Find what people need, then make it cheaper than anyone thought possible. In 1939, Crosley decided America needed a car that cost less than $300. The major manufacturers said, it couldn't be done. A proper car needed a proper engine, proper size, proper everything. Crossley disagreed. He launched the Crossley Automobile, a tiny car with a tiny engine and a tiny price. By 1942, he was selling 30,000 units a year. Then World War II happened. During the war, Crossley developed something special for the Navy. They needed portable generators, radar units, and field equipment. Weight was critical. Crossley's engineers created the CIBO engine, Crossley cast iron block assembly. This wasn't just small, it was revolutionary. The CIBO engine displaced just 724 cc, that's 44 cubic inches. For perspective, a single cylinder in a modern V8 displaces more than this entire engine. The block was a single casting of high strength iron. No separate cylinder sleeves, no head gasket. The head was copper brazed directly to the block at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, creating a permanent seal. This eliminated the most common failure point in engines. The engine used an overhead camshaft when Detroit was still using flatheads and side valves. The cam was driven by a system of gears and a short chain, eliminating the long timing chains that stretched and failed in other engines. Bore was 2.5 inches, stroke was 2.25 inches over square design for higher RPM capability. Compression ratio was 7.5.1, allowing it to run on low-grade fuel. But the real innovation was the fixed head design. By brazing the head permanently to the block, Crosley eliminated head gasket failures completely. The Navy loved it. These engines ran submarines auxiliary systems powered radar installations, generated electricity on PT boats. They ran for thousands of hours in salt spray, jungle humidity, Arctic cold. They just wouldn't die. When the war ended in 1945, Crosley had a problem. He had factory capacity, engineering expertise, and a proven engine design. But returning GIs wanted big, powerful cars, not tiny economy models. His passenger car sales were collapsing. That's when Crosley noticed something interesting. American farms in 1946 were in crisis. During the war, farmers had been pushed to maximum production. They'd worn out their equipment. Now they needed replacements. But full-size pickups were scarce and expensive. A new Ford F1 cost $1,283. A Chevrolet 3100 was $197 and those were base prices if you could find one. Dealers were adding hundreds in market adjustments. 
Meanwhile, farm tractors cost even more and were back-ordered for months. Crosley's engineers studied how farmers actually used pickups. They discovered something surprising. Most farm hauling trips were under two miles. Average load was 600 pounds. Average speed was 25 nidium force. Farmers didn't need a truck that could haul two tons at 70 minarespi. They needed something that could carry feed sacks from the barn to the pasture, move produce to the local market, haul tools around the property. The 1947 Crosley pickup was designed around these realities. The chassis started with Crosley's passenger car platform, but reinforced with heavier springs and a stronger rear axle. The wheelbase stretched to 80 inches, still tiny, but stable enough for cargo. Total length was a 145 inches. Width was 48 inches. Height was 60 inches. You could fit it in a modern elevator. The bed was the clever part. At 48 inches long and 40 inches wide, it seemed impossibly small, but the sides were low, just 12 inches high, and completely removable. The tailgate dropped flat. Suddenly you had a flatbed that could handle awkward loads, hay bales, feed sacks, milk cans, they all fit. The bed floor was reinforced hardwood over a steel frame rated for 1,000 pounds distributed load. Here's where the engineering got interesting. That 1,000 pound payload rating meant the truck could haul 87% of its own weight. The entire vehicle weighed just 150 pounds empty. For comparison, a 1947 Ford F1 weighed 3 to 100 pounds and was rated for 1,500 pounds payload, just 48% of its weight. The Crosley's strength to weight ratio was nearly double. This wasn't an accident. Crosley's engineers used aircraft construction techniques. The frame was lightweight, but rigid steel tubing. Body panels were thin gauge steel, formed for strength rather than thickness. Every component was analyzed for weight reduction. Even the seats were aircraft style. Tubular frames with canvas covers instead of heavy springs and padding. The CI Bay engine in civilian trim produced 26.5 horsepower at 5,400 RPM and 30.5 lbft of torque at 3,000 RPM. By 1949, improvements pushed output to 30 horsepower. These numbers sound laughable until you do the math. Power to weight ratio was 23 pounds per horsepower. A loaded 1947 Ford F1 was 38 pounds per horsepower. The Crosley actually had better power to weight when loaded. The transmission was a three speed manual with synchronized second and third gears, advanced for the era. First gear was a granny gear with 12.5.1 final drive ratio. This gave tremendous mechanical advantage. The little truck could climb a 35% grade fully loaded. Top speed was 50 mepoch empty, 40 mepoch loaded. But remember, average farm use was 25 mepoch for two miles. Now here's the kicker. Fuel economy was 50 miles per gallon empty, 35 mepoch hauling maximum load. In 1947, gasoline cost 23 cents per gallon, but it was still rationed in some areas. A farmer could run the Crosley all week on two gallons. A Ford F1 got 12 mid PG on a good day. The narrow track width, 45 inches, wasn't a limitation. It was a feature. Corn rows were typically planted 40 to 42 inches apart. The Crosley could drive between rows without damaging plants. Farmers could inspect crops, spray pesticides, or harvest small plots without crushing their fields. Try that with a full-size pickup. The first buyers weren't who Crosley expected, Urban businesses grabbed them immediately. Florists loved them for local deliveries. Newspapers used them for route distribution. Small groceries deployed them for neighborhood service. The U.S. Postal Service tested them for mail routes. The low step-in height, just 18 inches, meant drivers could hop in and out dozens of times per day without fatigue. But the real surprise came from military bases. The U.S. Air Force ordered hundreds for flight line service. The narrow width let them navigate between parked aircraft. The small turning radius, 17 feet, meant they could maneuver in tight spaces. They hauled tools, parts, and equipment around bases worldwide. 
Some were modified with specialized beds for specific tasks, mobile tool cribs, fire extinguisher carriers, ammunition haulers. The 1948 model added improvements based on customer feedback. The engine got better valve timing and a improved carburetor, pushing output to 28 horsepower. The electrical system upgraded from 6 to 12 volts. Hydraulic brakes replaced mechanical ones. The gear ratio was revised for better acceleration. Price increased to $129, still 20% cheaper than any competitor. By 1949, Crossley was building 100 pickups per week at their Marion, Indiana factory. They'd developed a dealer network of 1,200 outlets nationwide. But competition was coming. Kaiser Fraser was planning the Henry J. Volkswagen was eyeing the American market. And Detroit's big three were finally catching up with post-war demand, dropping prices on full-size trucks. The 1950 model year brought the biggest change, the new CyBA2 engine. Displacement stayed at 724 cc, but power jumped to 30 horsepower at 5,200 RPM. Torque increased to 35 lbft at 2,800 RPM. The improvement came from better porting, revised cam timing, and a new carburetor design. But there was a problem. The copper brazed head that made the Saiba engine so reliable had an unexpected weakness. In certain water conditions, electrolysis occurred between the copper brazing and iron block. Tiny holes developed, causing coolant leaks. The Navy hadn't seen this because they used distilled water or special coolants. Civilian owners used whatever water was available. Warranty claims mounted. Crosley developed the CIBA-2 with a conventional removable head and gasket. It solved the electrolysis problem but lost the original's indestructibility. Meanwhile, sales of all Crosley vehicles were declining. The compact car market hadn't materialized as expected. Americans wanted bigger, not smaller. The Korean War delivered the final blow. In 1951, the government restricted civilian use of strategic materials. Steel allocations went to military contractors. Crosley couldn't get enough material to maintain production. The last Crosley pickup rolled off the line in 1952. Total production was 5,258 units over six model years. But the story didn't end there. Crosley pickups found second lives in unexpected places. Resort hotels used them for grounds maintenance. Their light weight didn't damage golf courses or landscaping. Factories deployed them inside buildings where exhaust from larger vehicles would be dangerous. Some were converted to electric power for indoor use. Farmers who bought them kept them running for decades. The simple engine design meant any competent mechanic could maintain them. Parts were cheap when available, easy to fabricate when not. Many farmers report their Crosleys outlasted multiple full-size trucks. The low stress on components from the lightweight meant things just didn't wear out. The military applications continued long after production ended. The U.S. Navy used Crosley pickups at naval air stations through the 1960s. Their narrow width was perfect for aircraft carrier elevators. The Marines modified them for beach operations. The lightweight meant they wouldn't sink in soft sand. Some served in Vietnam as base utility vehicles. Today, Crosley pickups are coveted by collectors, but not for the reasons you'd expect. They're not valuable because they're powerful or beautiful. They're valuable because they represent a unique engineering philosophy that less can be more if it's exactly what you need. Let me put this in perspective. Modern pickup trucks have become massive. A 2024 Ford F-150 weighs 5,000 pounds and struggles to get 20 mpaji. It's 232 inches long, 87 inches longer than the Crosley. Its hood is higher than the Crosley's roof. It costs $40,000 base price. It can haul 2,300 pounds, but that's still just 46% of its own weight. The Crosley's 87% payload-to-weight ratio has never been matched by any mass-produced pickup. The Crosley pickup proved something important about American engineering. We tend to think bigger is better. More power solves every problem. But Powell Crosley Jr. showed that understanding the actual need, 
not the perceived need, leads to better solutions. Farmers didn't need trucks that could race on highways. They needed tools that could work in fields. Small businesses didn't need two-ton haulers. They needed efficient local delivery vehicles. The CIBA engine technology didn't disappear either. The overhead cam design influenced later small engines. The copper brazing technique was refined and used in racing engines. The lightweight construction methods appeared in everything from airport tugs to golf carts. Crosley was building utility vehicles before anyone invented the term. There's a deeper lesson here about American innovation. Crosley wasn't an automotive engineer. He wasn't from Detroit. He didn't follow industry conventions. He was a radio guy who looked at transportation differently. He asked different questions. Instead of, how can we make it bigger and more powerful? He asked, what's the minimum needed to do the job? That question led to a 30-horsepower pickup that could outwork vehicles with three times the power. The farmers who bought Crosley pickups weren't making a compromise. They were making a smart choice. They understood that a tool should match the task. You don't need a sledgehammer to drive finish nails. You don't need a 300-horsepower truck to move chicken feed around a small farm. The Crosley was exactly the right amount of truck for thousands of specific applications. Today, as we debate electric vehicles, autonomous driving, and sustainable transportation, the Crosley pickup reminds us that innovation doesn't always mean complexity. Sometimes it means simplification. Sometimes it means understanding what people actually need versus what marketing tells them they want. Sometimes a 30-horsepower engine and a four-foot bed is exactly the right answer. Powell Crosley Jr. died in 1961, nine years after his automotive company folded. But drive through rural America today, and you might still spot a Crosley pickup working on a small farm, puttering along at 25 millipurnch, hauling feed or tools or produce, just like it did 75 years ago. That's not failure. That's engineering success at its purest, building something so right for its purpose that it outlives its maker, its company, and even the era it was built for. What do you think? Could something like the Crosley pickup work in today's market? Or have we become too dependent on size and power? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. And if you've ever owned or driven a Crosley, any Crosley, I want to hear that story. Don't forget to subscribe because we're diving deep into more forgotten engineering marvels that changed America. Until next time, remember? Sometimes the best engineering solution is the smallest one that works.